exactly what's happened to this burial ground uh, over the centuries since the last uh, interment in the early 18th century. So Robert Lockyer was uh, a leveller also uh, and uh, uh, very much a new model army agitator who was arrested by Oliver Cromwell uh, in 1649 following the Bishop's Gate mutiny. Something that wasn't necessarily uh, about defending the rights of free people. It was rather, I understand, something to do with refusal to go to Ireland. He was executed by Cromwell in St Paul's Churchyard in 1649 April. And there are accounts that he was brought to the new cemetery uh, next to Moorfields um, in 1649. Now, so the connection there seems, seems pretty obvious with the burial ground, with that St Paul's Churchyard very close by. And at this time, the Bedlam burial ground was you know, the place uh, for anyone dying in London to be buried. John Lilburn, um, eight or so years later, we also understand was buried in Bedlam. Now why that was, I'm not entirely sure, because I think as Ted mentioned, at the end of his uh, life, the end of his life, uh, he's actually uh, in Kent, free, and dies, I think, of old age at about the age of 42. For some reason, he is brought back as well to be buried in the Bedlam burial ground. Uh, there is a historic map showing the burial ground. The blue areas are the areas we are excavating for cross uh, And we can see that our eastern ticket hall, which is the top right blue area, lies right across the footprint of the burial ground, but certainly not its entirety. Uh, the various descriptions um, historically describe how one acre plot was set out as London's first municipal ground outside the confines of a parish church. Uh, that's why it became popular, uh, apparently with dissenters and non-conformists generally as a place of burial. There it is slightly later on, um, in 1676, depicted there as the Bethlehem Churchyard. It has several names through the years. Now, we understand it closed in 1739. Uh, here is a newspaper report to that uh, particular happening. The annoyance of the neighbourhood become to the neighbourhood become so great um, as literally this small burial ground coping as an overflow for all the city parishes have become completely full. And very quickly, uh, we see again through historic maps mainly, the burial ground is utterly forgotten and it's built over initially by Georgian developers who were um, starting to develop a close network of alleyways and streets uh, around the area. And then by uh, the mid 19th century, uh, a new road layout, including Finsbury Circus and Liverpool Street, uh, had uh, disguised the burial ground uh, in a small area of garden. Just, you can just see that on this map depicted by three trees. And there it lay forgotten for very many years, various buildings. Um, <coughs> constructed on top of it and pretty soon it completely disappears from view. <coughs> now in 1861 uh, we see the first uh, discovery of human remains from this location. In this case it's from the new sewers that are being built all over the city and the workmen there coming across uh, hundreds of skeletons which were proposed to be from uh, some of the great plague victims which is very <coughs> close to reality. Then, in 1862, a year later, uh, the north side of Liverpool Street was utterly redeveloped by the North London Railway, who constructed this large Victorian railway station. And again, the newspaper articles um, of that time indicate that 72 boxes of human remains were taken out by the workers building the undercrofts for Broad Street Station. Uh, then in 1912, another report when the Metropolitan Line Railway, which runs on the south side of Liverpool Street underground, 
was extended into that uh, Broad Street station, more disturbance. Many more hundreds of skeletons were taken out. And so you can see the picture over the centuries. Uh, very big disturbances to the burial ground, which gives the question of looking for Lilburn or Loch here particularly um, something uh, to think about because who knows exactly where these graves are, the, the skeletons now. The uh, City of London Cemetery in Ilford was the receiving ground for all the skeletons disturbed by those Victorian constructions. And then we come to 1985 when that station itself was demolished and by that time archaeologists uh, were around to do some investigation anyway. So a Museum of London team uh, at that time were able to gain access to an area of the burial ground not completely destroyed by the Victorian Railway and they excavated some 400 individual skeletons uh, from a small area just to the north of where we're working today. In 2009, four crossroads started, so I have some more very unfortunate events occurred in Liverpool Street. Here a digger is just preparing a trench uh, for a new uh, electricity cable, obviously completely unaware of the history of this site. And very unfortunately you can see in the spoil there, that you can, that human remains have been piled up uh, in the piles of dirt, uh, completely erroneously. So, if we uh, put a, a modern map down, the grey area in the background is the original one acre plot uh, of the Bentham Burial Grounds. And then we've got the 18th century constructions being made around the edges of it, followed by the Victorian laying out of Liverpool Street and the Victorian terraces on the south side of Liverpool Street. Uh, then we've got the railway works for the Broad Street Station uh, and then the 85-86 work. So as you can see, uh, the colours aren't great here, but we're left with a fairly small area, this yellow one, which is pretty much all that's left of the burial ground. So in the context of looking for Lilburn or Lockyer and their remains, um, two individuals out of potentially 20,000 uh, buried in the, the ground over 150 years, and the odds are getting extremely low, aren't they? That we might actually come across these two individual graves. Could already be in Ilford. <coughs> so this uh, diagram just shows what's left. I mean, this, this kind of top layer really indicating the Liverpool Street Road surface, and then the fragments of burial ground left from the various modern utility disturbances and the foundations for these Victorian constructions uh, and then below actually is where the Victorian sewers have been constructed at depth. Well we're just starting now um, a detailed investigation into what's left of the burial ground and of course we became aware uh, very early on that, that Robert Lockyer and John Lilburn were potentially buried there and I think they have a huge historic significance uh, to this particular investigation. So, difficult working conditions before we get all the utilities uh, removed. This is some of our trial excavations to determine exactly what's left in that small footprint. Uh, and what we can see is that there are different types of burials made there from the mid 16th century through to the early 18th. Some of them extremely well preserved such as the one in the top left hand corner there, which is one of the very earlier burials made on the site in the 16th century, a simple shroud burial. Uh, on the bottom left you can see one of the large charnel pits uh, that we found several of, indicating really the disturbance to former graves that the grave diggers have made over, over those many, many decades, the burial and the burial ground. Very occasionally, in the uh, bottom centre there, we find brick vaults. So there's a few brick vaults been discovered, uh, and in this case, those lead coffins, I don't think, uh, belong to well, John, any of the Johns or Lilburns. Uh, in fact, we could identify these one of the very few burials we've been able to identify, as the coffins were made of lead, to the 
Jenks family, who we know very little about, but they had the um, desire and no doubt the wealth to construct their own brick built too, and using lead coffins uh, was an ex uh, extremely high outlay. And then on the, the right there, you can see um, burials which are uh, actually in very corroded wooden coffins, and they've been um, stacked one on top of the other in very many cases. So lots of multiple wood coffin burials um, <coughs> in large open pits. So we've got lots of different types of burial. Uh, in terms of who's buried there, we know a little bit from the parish registers, uh, which do refer to burial at Bedlam. So we've got that uh, historic documentary record, and we've found so far about 5,000 individual names in those registers. Uh, but linking any of that information to actual individuals on site, uh, or what's left of the site, um, is extremely, extremely scant. We are finding the occasional headstone. Uh, we've got about six headstones so far. Now all of these are smashed up, as you can see in these examples, and what they've actually, uh, where they've actually been found is reused in the foundations of those Georgian buildings. So very little um, attention to this graveyard. Here's another one just discovered last week, but unfortunately out of situ with this grave. So, you know, the key indicator we may get to identify an individual skeleton uh, from, from gravestones in any case, uh, so far very unlikely to occur. I mentioned wooden coffins and by the mid 17th century, um, like constructed wooden coffins is becoming absolute normal. Uh, you can see in this photo just how uh, eroded these are. You just see the fragments um, of wood in the outline. Some of these fragments are decorated with studs. Um, it's a possibility that uh, some of these studs represent uh, in some way a date or a name in terms of their patterning. We're literally just finding fragments like this. As you can see, there's a possible indication there are numerals, perhaps. The other fragments we're finding are uh, coffin handles, and then very importantly in the top there, coffin plates. So coffin plates were in use in the 17th century, uh, absolutely um, typically, uh, and they're, they're of course very useful uh, in excavations of graveyards for identifying individuals. However, in this case, <laughs> Unfortunately, although we've had very, very many fragments, uh, we haven't a single readable example yet. We have come across exquisite uh, burial plates positioned on the chest, very like this one, which is Oliver Cromwell's. Of course, this was only dug up a few years after he was buried, so it's still in a very good condition there. So, what other kind of evidence could we hold out for in the hope that we might be able to identify either Robert Lockyer uh, or John Lilburn? Now, Lockyer, of course, executed by firing squad six muskets, and some of the key evidence we're looking out for uh, in that case is evidence for the musket balls themselves, which could, in extreme circumstances, be found um, to have been retained inside the body cavity. These are examples of shot musket made of lead that we'll be looking for. Very occasionally these have been found uh, by our conscious to have been lodged in the skeleton. It's generally thought that at a small range they would actually pass straight through. <coughs> but nonetheless, the types of injuries that you'd expect um, from the firing squad give us our, our biggest opportunity if by a miraculous coincidence um, Lockyer's skeleton survives in a bit of ground we're digging. We should be able to identify those types of injuries from the osteological work that we do. Um, that is a, just an example from the site of um, an injury, a head injury that's healed. And of course injuries that are sustained at death are very, very easy to identify as there's been no regrowth in the bone. So, in Lilburn's case, 
course, we understand he died at the age of 42, really from old age. There's nothing really that we could tie down archaeologically uh, to the individual. And we do have um, tests such as ancient DNA and isotope work to identify you know, a little bit more about the individual lives that people uh, were digging up. Uh, but in the case of looking for two particular individuals out of what we expect to be about 3,000 excavated skeletons, that will be outside the scope of what we're able to do. So, there you go. Really uh, positive <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> Looking for the old Nokia is not easy <laughs> in this context. Um, the actual remains we're digging up will be reburied, and this is a shot of the cemetery out in Essex and Camden Island where all the remains from the burial ground will be reburied. It's, it doesn't sound, it's not too outlandish actually, because Essex has been receiving the uh, human remains from London for many years, from the start in 1865 when the City of London Cemetery was established in Milford, in Essex. This is an impression of Liverpool Street at a station entrance, which we'll be uh, completing in a few years' time. And so I just want to leave uh, with the question of uh, you know, how we might commemorate the site or how we might commemorate the particular individuals that we know are buried there that hold um, you know, an important place in the history of this country. There's an example from Burford for three that was shot uh, in that case. So I was going to open up to you guys really what you thought about. One, if we come across the remains and we can identify them, what would be the reaction publicly to that? And then also how we should commemorate this site, given that it was totally ignored, <laughs> built over and destroyed by our previous uh, generations. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, I, I think actually you should be told that you've got to find it. Because if they were found, it would be an absolutely amazing thing to then, because people would have to then know something about who they were. And I think, you know, so the idea that it's difficult, we understand that, but you can win. It's unlikely as well, but we're trying our best. We're looking out for these telltale signs. Um, we have about a uh, quarter now, 20 minutes for people to ask a question. So, yes, that's good. There is a room. A couple of questions to, to you, Jay. Um, were the original inhabitants of the Bedlam burial ground the inmates of Bedlam Hospital? Just uh, a not, basic question. Not particularly. Um, the name really comes from the fact that the burial ground was set out in, in the land belonging to the, the Bedlam Hospital Priory originally. So it really got that name association. There is uh, a likelihood that occasionally. Um, the inmate who died at the institution would have been buried locally, particularly if their um, parish of birth was unknown. So typically though, in the case of someone whose origins are known, they would be go back to the local parish to be buried. So it could be the case. And there is one or two references in the Bethlehem archives uh, to inmates uh, who perished in the institution being buried in the, in the Bedlam. So there may be one or two. And we found one very interesting example actually of an early uh, kind of cranial surgery uh, from one of the skeletons here. That could well be a link, I would imagine. Okay, just, yes. just if I could just have a question. Um, do you have a deadline for when your, the archaeology um, has to cease? Yeah, we're just um, into our second week of normal human time uh, into our dig, and that's actually, uh, it's two weeks. In, a, in reality, because we're doing a double shift, two teams working six days a week, so we're, we're working very rapidly. Uh, we've got a four-week period to excavate the particular layers of the cemetery, and then under that, under that we've got post-Roman and Roman remains too. So, in entirety, we're going to be working there um, in various phases up to the end of summer. But the, the excavation now of the burial ground and the largest area of it surviving is going on now till the end of this month, uh, at the latest into early April. 
So there is an opportunity for people to visit by the way. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to take up your last point about how perhaps we could commemorate uh, that the Lilburn was, was buried there. And that, is it not time to have a statue? Because I don't think there's a statue of Lilburn anywhere. Right. We do have an image, so it would be quite easy to create a, a statue. And I thought for a long time there should be statues of um, both Lilburn and Thomas Rainsborough because of the Putney debates comment. And it seems that and this is a logical place to have a, a statue yep. and that would commemorate, you know. Well, that's right, I mean, there is a scope for public art. There's a whole, kind of the image sort of showed, there's a whole new kind of urban realm designed to surround the station with new pedestrianization of Liverpool Street. So I would, I would think there's room uh, for something, whether it's a statue or not. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm really, Happy to hear suggestions, and then I can pass these on to Corporation London, and we'll see where we get with that. It's the City of London. Yes, the City of London uh, area. Yeah. Uh, there are there are uh, three others. So if we three questions, and then we'll see. Yeah. So first of all, you, and then you, and then. Yeah. Thanks. In the talk downstairs, it mentioned that he was resident in, in exile in Holland at one stage. Would that be traces in his? Remains of residence overseas? Um, not particularly. It's really only the first 10 years of life that like, like you can give um, you know, an origin to someone th through tests on the boat. And the other thing was he had a daughter just before he died, I think. He's a daughter or a son. Are there any ancestors you can. Well, none, none that we've come across so far or that have contacted us in terms it's of it's the Melbourne side. I'm oh, sorry, just a. To yeah. jump in. I, I know this because uh, the actor who plays John Lilburn in The Devil's Whore is related to John Lilburn through one of Lilburn's uncles. So, so there are Lilburn descendants still, the DNA, still well, around, but then obviously you've got a number of skeletons. Yeah. That That's a big problem. problem with it. If we had a small group, then that type of test would be possible, but for such yeah. a large amount, such a needle in a haystack. But the reason for him being buried there, would that not have something to do with his family? I think, sorry, sorry to bust it again, I think the reason why he's buried in um, Bethlehem is because of his conversion to Quakerism towards the end of his life. Yeah, and it's a non-conformist um, burial ground. That's really interesting. I mean, one of the things that were quite, that was quite popular amongst Quakers is the North-South burial as well. I think the orientation, mm -hmm. selecting a different orientation to the, the typical East-West. So far, all of our burials are east-west, but we're looking out for that north-south burial as well. That could be, you know, if it's one, yeah. <laughs> it could be a dead cert, that one. Thank you very much, and I'm very grateful to the panel for the, the splendid session. Uh, I chair the Swinton Archaeology and History Society, so uh, obviously we're fascinated by what Crosswell's been doing, and uh, I'm sorry if one of the panellists feels a bit left out through all these questions the other way. Um, to that end, I'd like to just echo what the gentleman in front of me said about uh, perhaps a, an appropriate commemoration of, uh, of this site, uh, and I'd like to ask Jay Carver if this presentation is going to be available online for a wider audience. Uh, this particular presentation I put together just for today, um, I'm not sure what the plans are. I know that the, I think the event has been filmed. It is. Yeah. Yes, online. Uh, and I guess it's going to be available yeah. online to, to rewatch. Yeah, I just wanted to perhaps go back to the the point that Jane was making at the beginning about how. Um, I suppose the degree of kind of historical vandalism you get in this part of London, really, in terms of the destruction of so much of it, and to, and really there's so much that, you know, I mean, the fact that it, you don't even know, or at least I didn't know until relatively recently in my life, that this was the site of Bedlam, because there's no real recognition of that, the hospital or of the, um, or of the burial ground, and I think it is very important we do try to get some kind of, commemoration of, of, of the people who were 
who were buried there, particularly yeah. um, if, we, if we can as a documentary film. But, but I wanted to ask another question, which is that, I mean, just thinking about all the Crossrail sites, you know, you had the map of them, and anybody who lives in London would be aware of what tremendous inconvenience it is across the whole sort of city. There's these huge sites across the, the whole of um, central London. It, and I'm just interested from, you know, the point of view of what you're talking about with archaeology, is that, does it represent a bigger opportunity for archaeologists than perhaps even the bombing after the war? I, I mean, you know, when I think about the, the amount of bombing there was and the number of bomb sites, I don't know whether there was much archaeological investigation. There probably wasn't that much because of, you know, it wasn't probably regarded as that important. But just be interested, this must be one of the biggest opportunities to, to investigate, not just the bedlam, but various other things across across yeah. London. I just yeah. wondered, you know, how, how is that sort of, you know, how do you deal with that and how do you yeah. sort of investigate that? Yeah. It's, a, it's a huge and positive opportunity. It's really only in the last two decades that um, archaeology has been professionalised to the extent that whenever new infrastructure developments and private ones are planned, uh, there is now not only a requirement to uh, undertake a detailed investigation, but there are also the resources. The thing about post-war reconstruction is that probably only a handful of archaeologists mm. calling themselves such a profession. Uh, now we do have extremely well-trained professional team that we can draw on uh, to undertake the type of scale of investigation that some of these larger projects require. So that has been the best opportunity for a, a modern project with a modern research team um, attached to it, we can really get the, you know, the most out of these opportunities. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm just thinking of a comment that Mary Beard made uh, at the poem of Richard III. Uh, <laughs> and um, I also, I mean, I wonder what the analogies are, <laughs> you know, or disanalogy. But uh, she rather provokingly said that the discovery of the body made not a jot of difference. It was insignificant, uh, historically. So I, I, I'd like to ask her whether he thinks finding Lilburn is important. Well, I can't go, um, I actually use that example in teaching, so I, uh, I say that's absolutely right, you know, what, what do we really, so I, I can't suddenly say, I mean, I think it would be, you know, really interesting, exciting if we did find Lilburn's remains, but I, I would, yeah, make the same point about, well, how much more would that tell us about John Lilburn uh, or the Levellers, because most of what we know about Lilburn, we know from his own writings or from writings of others about him. Um, and I don't think that discovering his remains would change that. I think what, what Jay has, you know, rightly kind of honed in on is the opportunity with the excavation of, of this burial ground to commemorate and, and to, to mark that movement in a public way, which really, you know, hasn't happened um, to any great extent in this country. I mean, we can see the, um, the plaque up there from Burford, there's obviously the small exhibition at Putney as well, but something, you know, that is more public, uh, perhaps sculpture, perhaps a statue, I think would be very fitting. to be able to keep talking about it, to explain it. Is anybody else got any question? Yes. Um, I appreciate that you're... Do you want to take the mic? Um, I appreciate you've got this uh, opportunity to hopefully, maybe, perhaps, um, locate the body of this very important left-wing activist. But I can't see that the heartland of British financial um, sector is going to want to see any kind of memorial to that. Um, surely they they are going to be bringing to pressure or pressure to bear I, to look for an early banker that they can memorialise <laughs> in preference. Surely. Yeah, yeah. I think it's much more likely that <coughs> we can get an agreement to to identify the Bedlam burial ground. That was a very diverse population. Uh, so I think the city would have difficulty in uh, objecting to that. 
But yeah, to single out individuals who are buried there, I think there may be a bit of an uphill struggle. Ha having said that, Burford is a, is a very Tory Cotswold town and has all these you know, memorials and annual celebrations and the Lebanon movement in it. Putney is another Tory constituency, another wealthy affluent part of, uh, of London. So I don't think it necessarily means that we can't uh, get something up there commemorating Lilburn just because this is in the heart of the city uh, banker territory. But I, I also think that it's too... I mean, you're employed by them, yep. I assume. Mm -hmm. uh, but them being the city, they, there are aldermen, <laughs> and there are officers in the city who in fact would be very interested, I think, if a character, if it could be identified and, and clearly, I think there could be a movement to, to demand that. And I, they're not quite the extreme, you know, sort of Tories in the city of London. They're very <coughs> worried at the moment about their links with Europe. And you've got to remember that. And Lilburn's a good example of somebody who, in fact, also was, you know, across the I mean, I just think there could be, a, there could be an argument. And it isn't that, in fact, they're just looking for bankers. They would be interested also in the whole thing about what it is that could sell an area like this. I and mean, it's, you know, it's those sort of things that I think you know, one, one could use as an argument for it. Yeah. Well, I was just going to skip, uh, sort of pick up on your point that the whole process here is in danger of again sort of commodifying mm -hmm. his memory. Uh, it becomes part of the heritage industry. You know, okay. saw this morning in, a, uh, in the Newark uh, project, mm -hmm. which is a, an entertainment for some kind. So I think there's huge dangers that it'll actually kind of destroy its true memory and just kind of reproduce some kind of tea towel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that, that is a risk, although I have to say I'm enormously excited about the opportunity to buy a little bit 400 um, T-shirt. I gave a talk at the People's History Museum a few weeks ago, and one of the things that really upset me is that they, they don't sell any kind of reproductions of all of the wonderful radical you know, objects and iconography that they've got. I mean, we can have all this royal nonsense, you know, mugs and tea towels and all the rest of it. Why don't we have our own equivalent, uh, you know, set of uh, objects that we can, we can uh, purchase and, and enjoy? I think there is something, there's something nice about that, and it actually fits in with uh, radical movements in the past as well, and the way in which they use material culture as well as texts um, to sort of uh, you know, focus their movements and to, to commemorate uh, past movements. But yes, I mean there is there is a danger always with any um, you know political figure, radical movement that by heritageizing them, we kind of neuter them, we, we weaken their significance, and we weaken their contemporary re resonance. I mean the thing that jumps into my mind right now is Selma and the trouble that Obama has got into for allegedly politicising this you know this moment in American civil rights history because. Obama was pointing to the continued problems that uh, you know, surround race in the United States. And obviously the people who are criticizing him are exactly the people who want this stuff hived off into this safe you know, past that this is done with. We now, you know, we have a democracy, so we don't need to bother with people like Lilburn can just be seen as you know, a forerunner. We don't have to you know, think about any of the questions that he might you know, pose to us in the 21st century, we can just say, we've got democracy now, everything's fine, but let's look back at these, you know, illustrious ancestors of ours. So I think that is something that has to be guarded against. I think events like this do a good job of doing that by letting us discuss uh, the legacy of these individuals. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I think, um, apologies, I've just joined you because I've been going upstairs. Um, I think one of the issues that comes out to me from the from Bilbo and from the whole uh, revolutionary nature of the 1640s that seems to be lost, particularly by the monarchist unionist Labour Party and so on, is the Republican element, which dare not speak its name. Now, there is a movement called Republic, and I, I will never fall out like in, in a fissiparious manner like some of the sects did in the 1640s, but I can't see a Republican move, uh, a movement for a Republic that has the Union Jack as its symbol is really working in, in, the, in the correct direction because we're not interested in maintaining a union based on the Tory of 1707 
is this republican nature. They, you know, they were looking for, and it was all couched in religious language, but that's what they were looking for. A common treasury for all is not about having somebody running the country in the interest of the city of London. So I think that seems to me to be the message that's got lost over the period. And the fact that there have been period, people who picked that up in the 1790s and the people who picked that up like Shelley does in the first half of the before. These are, these are still Shelley's uh, leitmotif is the, is the English Civil War, is the Anglo-Saxon period. He looks back at those particular significant issues. And even now, Shelley's, uh, he went through the whitewashing and was sort of cleaning up the, mm. the ineffectual angel and all that, and then was up in New College, Oxford, having been kicked out, turned into a sort of Michelangelo figure. It's all this cleansing of, of our history. And I think republicanism is what Shelley comes back to say, I mean, we are all Greeks, the preface to Ellis. So we have this deep understanding of republicanism, but it's always been airbrushed out. And I think that's what needs to come back, because until we can confront the structure, constitutional, archaic constitutional structures in this country, the democratic revolution we need will not be completed. And the left is particularly very good on economism, it's very good on laborism, it's very poor on democratic yeah. socialism. Mm. Uh, it's, we are going to have to leave in one minute. So, if it's a quick question. Oh, it's just, no, yes. Just a quick yes. Just, just, think, yeah. just on the subject of statues in the city in London, there is a statue to John Wilkes of Peter Street. Mm. So, I think those are. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we'll put together. <laughs> the, the question is also, is how he is labelled. And the idea that, you know, if it's going to be radical, mm. or a radical, or a Republican, or... I mean, it's, it's actually the wording that's attached to explain him, which is also hugely important. But can I thank both of you for a very, very stimulating hour and thank you.